This chapter comes from, uh, it's a study on these verses here in Matthew uh, 22, 30 through, uh, 35 through 40. And this is all about these two commandments that Jesus gives us. And we studied last time, we saw some of the context uh, in which Jesus was approached uh, and, and the questions that came to him. And we learned these couple of things. So this is a review. We saw, first of all, uh, at the beginning of this chapter, that Christians will always be questioned. Uh, and you're going to be questioned about your faith. You claim to be a Christian. You claim to follow Jesus. And so you're going to be questioned about that. And, uh, and you need to know Christ well enough to be able to answer some of those questions. Obviously, there's a lot of questions that you're not going to be able to answer because you just don't know the answer to them. And you've got to dig farther into the Word and find those answers. But you've got to be ready for questions because they're going to come. We also learn this, that the devil will tempt us or test us uh, and test our knowledge of God's word or our belief in God's word. The devil is constantly trying to create doubt in your life. And we talked last time about Adam and Eve. And you remember the devil comes along and tempts them and, and says to Eve, oh, God didn't really say that you can't eat from that tree. And, and so he, he's tried to twist it. And, and we learned that even, uh, we may even hear Bible verses from people that may not be followers of Jesus, but they might even try to use Bible verses. The devil can use Bible verses, just as he did with Jesus, to try to test our knowledge and see if we actually believe the Word of God. And so we came to this thought, well, how do we know if, it's, if, if the devil's trying to twist it, if we're not understanding it right? How do we know? And really comes down to studying more and having a deeper relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, studying the Word of God, we need to uh, do that more and more. Christine. Your wife, Christine Hennepin, take your captive. Yeah, take your thoughts captive, which is a great, another great verse that we'll get into in the next couple of chapters. Last time, then, we also talked about this point three. There are those who say they're followers of Christ, uh, but, but their responses show that they are not. So, j in other words, just because somebody says, oh, I'm a Christian, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they're following God's Word. Um, because as we saw several examples, you remember Judas Iscariot. I mean, here he is, right? He's traveling with the 12 apostles. Everybody thinks he's a true follower of Jesus. He ends up betraying Jesus. So it is possible uh, that, uh, that there are those that may try to convince us that they're following Jesus. The only way we're going to know the truth, again, is through this book right here. Uh, not that we're always going around, you know, doubting everybody, oh, are you saved? You're probably not saved. You know, that's not what we're trying to do. Uh, but we know that it is possible that people can claim to be saved, but they may not be saved. And so um, that's important for us uh, to understand because the devil comes along and he just slaps a Christian label on something, but it may just be the worldly or his own wrong philosophy slapped with a Christian label and and you think just because it has a Christian name on it that it's a good thing or a biblical thing, but that may not be the case. Quickly, yeah. I have a thought. Um, doesn't it have to do with our actions? Like, do you flout Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and in fact, that's what we learned at the very end of that last section. A true follower is known by their obedience. We obey Christ's commands. That makes the difference. Uh, and that was letter C under point three there. And that's where we left off last time. Today, I want to get into uh, the real um, focus of this chapter. And that is on the two commandments of, Christ's, uh, of Christ. Rather. There are two responsibilities uh, that, will, uh, that will set us free from our strongholds. And, and so... I want you to see these two commands um, from Christ. Now, remember, if we're followers of Christ, then that is going to be known by our obedience of Christ. So when Christ says, do this, as followers of Christ, we're going to say, hey, I want to do what Jesus wants me to do. So I, I'm going to make it a point right now to say, okay, if Jesus tells me to do something, even though I don't 
I may not know what it is right now, but I'm going to make a decision right now. I'm going to do it. I'm going to listen to Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to obey Jesus. Uh, and so now we get to these two commandments. Uh, Jesus was questioned, and, they, and, and one lawyer comes to him and says, what's the greatest commandment? And we talked about it last time in the Old Testament scriptures, there's somewhere on the order of 613 commandments. And, and so he says, what's the greatest one? Jesus gives an answer. This is the answer that we want. Uh, and, and this is the foundation, really, of freedom that we're going to find in, uh, in, the, in the words of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're getting ahead of me, so hang on. Yeah. Yeah. So now let's look at these. Let's look at these uh, and, and see what God says. First of all, know this. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Uh, this is the, the passage in Matthew 22. There's another parallel passage that also adds all thy strength. Uh, and, uh, and that may be helpful as well. But we're going to just dig into this, this uh, verse right here. So loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your Mind. So, point number four in the book here is this. Loving the Lord your God will remove your addiction. Loving the Lord your God will remove your addiction. Now, we, the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says, uh, and, and, and Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus is the truth. He is the one that sets us free. And so the reality is, if we're not experiencing freedom, we're not running to Jesus and getting from Him the freedom. And that may be because we don't really love Him as we ought. And so what I want to do is I want to look at this command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. I want to look at this command because this is going to help us to understand how to be free from our addictions. Let me make this statement. Your addiction is the love of your life. Your addiction is the love of your life. What happens when we have addictions, is we allow something else to be so attractive to us and, and so uh, wonderful to us that we actually begin to love that more than we love God. And it becomes an idol in our lives. Now, we don't, we don't create idols and set them up. I, I hope that you don't. Uh, but maybe you don't have an idol, a statue in your house that you would kneel to and pray to. And you'd say, well, I don't have idols. I don't have to worry about that command of, uh, you know, not to make any idols. But here's the reality. When we love anything more than we love God, we have created in our hearts an idol. And so that we are giving love and affection to that idol. In that moment... Now, just because you, you fall in addiction doesn't mean that, that oh, you're, you're not saved. Now, it could mean that if you've never trusted Christ. But, but if you have trusted Christ and, and you, you still fall, uh, that's because in that moment, even as a follower of God, you've decided, I want to go back to this idol. And I'm going to bring this idol back out. And I'm going to love this idol. It's, it's an idol in your life. Your addiction is the love of your life. And that's a dangerous place to be. Mm -hmm. Eating right, dog, and you're wasted on choosing the Right. Right. And, and so what we want to do is we want to see how this command, Jesus says, love the Lord your God. It's real. If you learn to love the Lord your God, it will remove your addiction. You know, if you've talked to people that that have seen deliverance from an addiction. 
And they've seen that deliverance through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It almost seems strange or impossible because they say, well, I, all I can tell you is that God took it from me. Have you ever heard somebody say that? God took it from me. And, and the reality is, they loved God more. And they, loved, they fell in love with Jesus. And so that they didn't need that, that love of their life anymore, that other love, because they love Jesus Christ now. They love the Lord God. And so that's taken the place. And, and what they used to love almost seems repulsive. Now, how did I love that when I've got so much more in Jesus Christ? And so that's what we're looking for is this deliverance. And we find it in this, in this command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Now, I want to keep moving here because I've got a lot that I want to share. And uh, you know me. I tend to talk a whole lot. So let's think about this. Our first responsibility is to God. Our first responsibility is to God. So Jesus says, here's the first command. And then he'll say, the second command, as we know, is love your neighbor as yourself. But the first command is to love the Lord your God. So the priority in finding deliverance from any addiction and any sin struggle The priority is on our relationship with God, not necessarily our relationship with everything else around us or everyone else around us. Our main priority is how am I loving God? What is my relationship with God? That's the priority. Our first responsibility is to God. He's created us and we are Uh, We will exist somewhere forever. Someday, you're going to be in his presence. And you know what? Nothing else is going to matter. So let's keep that priority, right? Our first responsibility is to our creator God. That's our first responsibility. And so in this verse, now we're going to kind of look at this. It says, with all your heart, we're going to think emotions. With all your soul, we're going to think your will. And with all your mind, we're going to think emotions your thoughts. And so let's talk about the heart, the soul, and the mind, and let's see how can I love God with all my heart, my emotions, with all my soul, my will, and with all my mind, my thoughts. Because if I can love God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind, then I'm going to find that I have freedom from this addiction. God will deliver me from this addiction. And so, what does it mean to love the Lord in this way? First of all, number one, all your heart. This is the seat of your emotions. So, uh, letter B, under dissect and define, we have uh, number one, and this is all your heart. We've got several verses here that uh, may be a help. I guess they're almost big enough to read up there. <laughs> but if you need to pull the, the, uh, the Bible, I'd encourage you to do that. In Hebrews 4 is uh, where we see this first one here. And I'm going to turn there because I think it's a little too small on my paper here. So, Oh, they are in your book as well. Right. So Hebrews 4, 12, and you've heard this before, uh, maybe. For the Word of God is quick, that is alive. It's a living word. It's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Um, Our heart has intentions, has thoughts, has feelings. The Word is what can discern those things. Have you ever had a feeling... Uh, And then later on, you find out what you were feeling was not necessarily right, accurate, true. Yeah. Our feelings can be off base sometimes. Our feelings can lead us astray. And in the middle of how you're feeling, when when you're in the middle of it, you don't have a lot of clarity to know that what you're feeling is wrong because the feeling is so strong. I mean, th- you think of puppy love, right? You know, so you got, you got uh, uh, two first graders, you know, and they're like, oh, 
I love you. You know, and we all like, oh, that's really cute. You know that's not real. But, you know, somehow in their, in their minds, they think there's something going on there, okay? Um, all right. Our emotions can carry us away. And in the middle of it, you don't necessarily understand that your emotions are wrong because you're so carried away with that emotion. And, and so how do we know if our feelings are right or wrong? The Bible. The Bible. The, the, the Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How are you feeling? And what are your feelings right or are they wrong? The Bible gives us the answer. In 2 Corinthians 10 uh, and verse 5, here's another one. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This was the verse that Christine was mentioning just a minute ago. So th- what do we have to do with our hearts? Well, first of all, with the scriptures, we can discern this feeling is wrong or this feeling is right. When we find out that this feeling is wrong, we got to capture that and cast it out. Get rid of the wrong feeling and embrace the right feelings that come through our relationship in Christ. And so we, we take into captivity every thought. We cast down those high things, the wrong feelings that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Always bearing in mind, Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I cannot emphasize this enough. You cannot trust your heart. You cannot follow your heart. The world today may say, just trust your heart. It is a lie from the devil because your heart is deceitful. Your heart can be deceived and it deceives you. And you think, this is my heart. Nobody knows my feelings better than me. Yeah, yes, somebody does. God. He created you and he knows your feelings and God knows when they're wrong. And he knows how to, uh, how to identify those wrong feelings. Um, your heart is the seat of your emotions. I've got another verse here, and I think it's in your, pa- in your is it in your verse? No, it's not. 1 John 4, 16. Let me turn to this passage, uh, because that's really small up there. 1 John chapter 4, and you might just jot it down uh, so that you can look at it again later. So 1 John 4, verse 16, and I'm going to read down through verse 19. Okay, the Bible says this, We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love, which comes from God, casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Okay, all of these verses. Here's the flow. The flow is, The only way that you can know truly the emotion love is when you learn it from God. And then the only way that you can show that true emotion, the right emotion, love, is when you allow God to produce that through you. Now look, this is a huge deal. Because, i got to tell you this, I, I have counseled a lot of people who have problems in relationships, problems in marriages, problems with with lust, okay? Usually, the problem is they have never understood what real love is. They've never understood it. Because what they think of as real love is what they see on a movie screen or what what they find on the internet or what they read in some romance novel, that's what they think love is. And that's what they think how it's supposed to be. And they don't take their instruction from God. God is love. They don't find the true definition 
from God himself. And so in their own minds and from the world around them and from their own emotions, which are twisted and wrong and deceitful, they come to this decision on what love is. And when we start looking at what love is from the Bible, people say, I never knew that. I never knew that's what love really was. And then God can begin to work a real healing in their hearts and their lives and their relationships because they learn what love is from the one who created love. Okay? That's so important. That's so important. Loving God will remove your addiction. It will. Because what we, what we have is, is the wrong emotion in our hearts. I know there's a lot of different things that we could discuss right now, but I want you to try to learn from what God's Word is teaching us right now. Uh, and, and rather than looking for, you know, some kind of exceptions um, to it. Um, let me see, I'm checking the time here. It's 8.43, and I'm not going to get through everything that I wanted to. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, I'll just go a little bit farther, and then we'll, and then we'll stop. Um, but let me get a couple of things here. As, as I'm talking about how to love God with our emotions, what we just discussed with these verses, I want to kind of put it in this little diagram for you. Identify, reject, and promote. We're thinking right now, I want to love God with my emotions. How do I do it? Identify. First of all, you're going to identify the wrong feelings. You use the Word of God to do that. You fill your heart with God's Word, this is not in your notes. You might have to just jot these things down. But you let the Bible discern for you what is the right emotion and what is the wrong emotion. So you've got to be filled with the Bible. This is why it's so important that we have our, our daily devotions. This is why it's so important that we spend time listening to God's teachers. It's, it's so important for us to spend time in God's Word because the Bible is the discerner. So once we identify this is a wrong emotion because the Bible shows us that. Then we reject that wrong emotion. We reject the wrong feelings. Um, remember that feelings do not determine reality. This is important. When you're in the middle of feeling something, that to you is reality. If you're depressed, you're down, and, and that is reality to you. And you think the world's going to crash. Everything's going to fall, fall in on you because of, of those emotions. And that seems to be real to you. But your emotions do not create reality. Okay? <laughs> Are you having chips up there, Jim? <laughs> we can hear them up there. Anyway... <laughs> I see everybody looking around. What's going on? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So wrong feelings must be evaluated and, and rejected. Okay. This is a wrong feeling. This isn't reality. I got to cast it out. So important. If you're learning to love God with your emotions. And then you promote. What do you, you promote? You promote the godly feelings, the right feelings that God gives. So you examine God's love and how God reacts to us, and then you let that determine reality in your life. Uh, you let that uh, develop, those, those right feelings develop in you. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of how you love God with your feelings, You've got to identify the wrong feelings using Scripture. You've got to cast those wrong feelings out. And then, using Scripture and the love of God, you identify the right feelings. And so then you promote those feelings and let those feelings guide you and lead you in your life. Guess what? Right here, the fruit of the Spirit, these things are going to guide you in the right feelings. If you learn what the, the fruit of the Spirit love is, the willing sacrificial giving of oneself for the benefit of others without the thought of return. Just knowing that definition is going to help you identify in your life this is not love or this is love. And so then you can cast out the wrong and embrace the right. Just 
uh, knowing these definitions. A cheerful, calm delight. This is joy. A cheerful, calm delight and rejoicing in a particular circumstance. I'm not cheerfully delighting and rejoicing in this circumstance. Okay, it's not joy, is it? I've got to cast out the wrong feeling and I've got to embrace the right feeling. God's in control. God has allowed this circumstance. I can take joy knowing that God is in control and that He's going to handle this situation for me. And so, just these definitions. And this is what we're studying in the RU program. And so going through these things, you're going to be able to learn and discern right feelings, wrong feelings, so that you can love God with all your heart. Uh, let's see. How many slides do I have left? I'm, I think I'm going to stop right here. And next time, I'm going to pick it up with loving God with all your soul. So uh, this gives us enough to think about and chew on uh, for this week. Because remember, your addiction is your idol. It's the love of your life. You need to learn to love God more than that addiction. And part of loving God is loving Him in your heart, your emotions allowing the right emotions to guide you rather than the wrong fleshly emotions to guide you. Okay, we'll pick it up there next time and, uh, and we'll get more of this, uh, which I think will be a, a great help. Let's, uh, let's bow together and pray and then we'll get into uh, any awards that we have. God, I thank you so much for showing us uh, some truth tonight. And sometimes it's easy for us to... Uh, I guess to slip into loving the wrong thing and creating idols in our lives. I pray that, Lord, you would help us to get rid of these idols. Help us to develop a true, genuine, real love relationship with you. And as we do that, I pray that you would truly deliver us from these false gods, these idols in our lives that have become a great love to us in this life. So Lord, guide us and direct us uh, through your word to know how to love you in our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.